Welcome to the broadcast. I'm David Feldman. It's Friday, November 22nd, 2013. Comedian Mort Saul for the hour. Joining us from his home in Mill Valley, California, is Mort Saul. His Twitter handle is Mort Saul Says. Mort Saul, thank you so much for joining us. Well, it's a pleasure, David. It's, you know, uh, I'm glad to catch up with you. And uh, the, the I was listening to uh, KPFK last night. <laughs> I listened to it in bed, you know, and uh, to Roy mm-hmm. after all these years. And KPFA up here. It's a miracle that something like Pacifica Radio in America still exists, isn't it? Well, I think uh, it doesn't exist in the way I, I found it. You know, I mean, last night I heard a bunch of propaganda against the Tea Party. You know, like they're the enemy. Mm-hmm. It should only be that simple. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, you created modern comedy. Everything good we see on a comedy stage flows through Mort Saul. If you go back and listen to any Mort Saul album from the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, they are eternal time capsules filled with learned, improvisational, verbal jazz. Well, the hungry eye, you know, will be 60 years in December, December 22nd. Yeah. And Woody's going to be out here to Throckmorton. Woody and Allen. I'll be out here with him. So uh, I, I was lucky up here. You know, I never could get it started in L.A. I really struck out there. Struck out in New York initially. It all kind of flowed out of the Bay Area at the time. At the time. It was... Uh, a much more optimistic time. I don't think of you striking out in Los Angeles. I mean, you did every major talk show. You made some movies. You wrote for Clint Eastwood. Yeah, I, I couldn't. I couldn't get the act started when I started that around fifty one. I couldn't get it going anywhere. I couldn't get a steady platform to find out what the act is, and uh, so I finally got up here and got a regular job where I could find it. You know. I couldn't get started in New York. It was just the way the Bay Area was then. I don't think it is anymore. And, uh, except for Lucy of Throckmorton. Lucy Mercer, she, thank you very much, yeah, Lucy Mercer. Yeah, pretty open-minded, you know. Yeah. Uh, a very American tradition. And I really came back up here because of that. You know, I had everything break up at home. And I staggered around Los Angeles now. Finally, I came back to where I was lucky the first time and uh, got a little better organized up here. Let me tell you a quick story and have it lead into a a bigger question. Henry Bushkin is or was Johnny Carson's lawyer. Mm -hmm. He just wrote a book about Johnny Carson revealing some of Johnny's darkest secrets. Yes. And and I... (laughs) I wrote a tweet that said, not only did Henry Bushkin, Johnny Carson's lawyer, write a tell-all book about Johnny Carson, he billed the estate for the hours it took him to write it. Yeah. And he sent me an angry note saying- Really? Yes. Good for you. Henry Bushkin said, how dare you do this? I gave Johnny Carson two years of my life, blah, blah, blah. And I wrote back to him- You're Johnny Carson's lawyer, or you were Johnny Carson's lawyer. You've written a tell-all book. Do you know right from wrong? He didn't answer that question. Does America Uh, America know right from wrong anymore? uh, No. No, they don't. They're conned very easily, and it's going to be an expensive lesson. Uh, Johnny uh, confided everything to this guy. And I was surprised as his confidant that he would do that. The book was uh, sent to me by my biographer, uh, Jim Curtis. And he, uh, I was surprised because the lawyers usually carry the dark secrets. Johnny and I go back, you know, we're both signed together at CBS in 54. 
And uh, I came from the nightclubs, and he came from uh, Who Do You Trust? And, of course, he found his his, uh, great fortune at the other network. But um, they gave us $2,000 for 13 weeks. (laughs) And and reluctantly, I might add, but I can't believe that an attorney would do that. Or maybe I do believe it. And you would think there would be more outrage than there is. Uh, no, not not nowadays. I mean, uh, everybody measures outrage against what it's going to cost them. Is it, uh, you know, is it smart instead of going with their feelings? I don't know if they have any feelings anymore. I mean, uh, they're ready to elect the Hillary Clinton. And uh, the last I saw of her, she was... Uh, at Dover Air Force Base, worrying about that ambassador. And nobody yet answering for Benghazi. Uh, The liberals seem to be lodged in a permanent place now, which is uh, that they're better than the other guys. I hope they're better than that. Well, I'm not so sure they're better than the other guys. You told Tom Brokaw that that JFK told you that liberals were going to give him a harder time than conservatives. What did J- <laughs> what did JFK mean by that? Well, he was talking about at the time about their uh, their basic nature because they don't believe in a lot. I mean, let's be candid here. There, a lot of them were communists when they were kids, and they settled for being social democrats in the classic European sense, later, so that they're talking, uh, you know, so that whatever, if Oprah Winfrey can activate their guilt <laughs> at a movie complex, that's where they act them out. They don't know from nothing. They never gave any skin to Rand Paul or Ron Paul or uh, Gary Johnson. It's that self-righteous stuff. And it gets that back way back to the struggle between men and women. I don't think women want to win. They want to see how much you value them, but they don't want to win. And I, I've been married three times. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. I know a little about it. Uh, I have marriage counseling tonight, so I'm just writing that oh. down. I, I unfortunately, I've done that too, David. Unfortunately, I've done that too. Uh, quite unsuccessfully, <laughs> but uh, not for the marriage uh, counselor. <laughs> no, that's right. That's a going, a going bloodless uh, industry. But how come your mother didn't need that? How come your mother had the key to your father? That's the question. And what's the answer? That's one of the questions. <laughs> <laughs> what's the answer? Well. Uh, they they won by being intuitive and going with their feelings. In other words, the step up is a step down. The so-called equality. Uh, it's a con job. It's a con job to win an election. I mean, when the president gives the Medal of Freedom to Gloria Steinem, where do you think we are? She's going to be the leader of the malcontents? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, look at her targets. You have her. And she showed up at the Vienna Youth Festival working for the CIA. Now she'll take all the girls that are unhappy with the status quo and try and capitalize on that. Mort, can you give me one second? I'm putting my sunglasses on because the lights here... <laughs> At KPFK, the phones are just exploding with people calling Have up. Have they done anything about the furniture yet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is our, none. Our, they got rid of it. I was down there with Roy, and it was, he interviewed me there. You seem a little to the the right of me and a little to the right of the audience we're talking to. Was JFK a little to the right of our memory of him. Well, I met him. He loved having lunch with Nixon up there in the Senate. And uh, Adlai Stevenson was a star of the Democratic Party at that time. Uh, but 
the president, the most important speech the president gave is the one the month before he dies at American University when he says, uh, not a peace for our time, but a peace for all time, because in the last analysis, the Russians breathe the same air we do. We both cherish a future for our children, and we are all mortal. Mm -hmm. And then he leaves us. And then he leaves us. And that was a lot of what motivated uh, the garrison investigation. Right. And all these people who were on all week crying about him. By the way, the broadcast show is on tonight, you know. On NBC. Yeah. I'm not on the show. I was eliminated from the program, but I'm in the book. You know, he did a book, mm -hmm. which is at, at called Where Were You? And I'm in there. And uh, I'm the only one in the book that says he didn't die a natural death. <laughs> Tom Hanks and Vincent Bugliosi are in there ridiculing uh, conspiracies. But it only takes more than one person to have a conspiracy. Uh-huh. Uh, it's very sad, you know, uh, very sad. The whole week was full of lies. Among the principal liars, Bob Schieffer at CBS. And don't forget that Jim Garrison named NBC. Frank McGee was the first critic of the of uh, the arrest of Clay Shaw. And then Walter Sheridan worked for Bobby and also worked for NBC. Or Bobby would have moved with a lot sooner to our side. That's a lot of stuff I hope will come out as we talk. Yeah, I want to get to that. In obviously, that's all I want to talk about. But this is kind of just. Yeah. Uh, I want to anything you want. Sure. Okay. I, I want to lead up to it. You were not the host, but you performed at the 1960 Democratic convention where JFK got the nomination. Were you hired by Joe Kennedy to appear? I was at the hired by the father. Yeah. And uh, I was hired by him to do the jokes, and uh, uh, and I was at the convention. I had I was on Channel Nine then, with doing a show from the convention. I also was a correspondent for the Hearst papers, so I was there a lot. And uh, some funny stuff happened around there. Uh, one day I was going down to see him. He stayed at the Billboard, you know, downtown LA. And as I was leaving, Eugene McCarthy said to me, you know, if there was any justice in this country, I would be the nominee because I'm twice as intellectual as Stevenson. I'm twice as uh, liberal as Humphrey. And I'm twice as Catholic as Jack Kennedy. <laughs> and I went down to the hotel and I told that to the president. And he never smiled. He just said to me, he's right. <laughs> 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 and... Uh, Mrs. Roosevelt, you know, wanted Stevenson nominated, and she sent McCarthy to make the uh, uh, the presentation speech, which was tremendously moving. Mm -hmm. You you wrote in Heartland that Adley Stevenson lamented that in the end there's nobody to talk to. Is that? Yeah, you? that's what he said. And what did he mean by that? And I find as I get older, that's kind of true, isn't it? Yeah, it's the story of life. Yes, that's right. You've come upon it a lot earlier than he did. He said he was locked up there as U.N. ambassador in the quarters at the Waldorf, and there wasn't really anybody he could break down and uh, talk to. He's the finest man I ever knew. I mean, incredible and warm and gentle and uh, a real test of the Democrats, which they failed. He was to the right of Henry Wallace, though, right? Of Henry Wallace? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the story I heard is that Roosevelt submitted a list of vice presidents, and Wallace led it, followed by Justice William O. Douglas, and ending with Truman. And the list was inverted by the Democratic chairman, Steve Hannigan. Hmm. And then you get Truman. Truman brings in James Burns, and he drops the bomb, which they, the other two never would have done, on Japan, and he creates the CIA and the Pentagon. 
Yeah. And the first Secretary of Defense, James Forrestal, jumps off the window and kills himself. First death that wasn't investigated. Really? Yeah. He's yelling about communism. And he went out the window. Whether he was thrown or he walked. <laughs> Forrestal. Who was a pretty reasonable man up until then. What year was that? But the whole idea of taking a guy's Secretary of Defense makes him the number one uh, purchasing agent in the world. Look what it became. It became Blackwater, in effect. Mm -hmm. Back to Kennedy. Eric Prince, a civilian contractor. Eric Prince, right. Which so, uh, everybody's. Huh? Let Go me ahead, ask you about. Let me ask you about Kennedy. The impression that I got is that it didn't sit well with you being that allied with the president of the United States, and you ended up pushing back at the Kennedy administration. Didn't you kind of alienate Joe before the assassination? Yes. Uh, well, no. After, after he got elected, when I started with the royalty and don't do that. I was recording for Sinatra on Reprise, and uh, they were starting to pass on the material. And they were playing it like any capitalist. You know, they're saying, you could be a king, you know, if you shut up. Mm -hmm. But I didn't like the whole approach to royalty. And I thought they could be kidded. I thought that was the game. That's what we're supposed to do. Were but you... instead of that, they gave us a diet that they're giving us with Obama now. So the, Except now it's got racial overtones. So the Kennedy administration didn't like their gestures uh, coming too close to the bone. Well, a lot of the liberals in show business said so. He never said so. In fact, uh, Roper, remember Elmo Roper, the polar? Yeah. He came in to see me at the Crescendo, and he said, regardless of what you hear from the underlings, he loves what you're doing. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, the president said to Time magazine, uh, Mort is in relentless pursuit. And they said, of who? And he said, everybody. <laughs> and I think that's the job, really. Keep them honest. So let's turn to November 22nd, 50 years ago. The president was shot. I, ass yeah. I assume that because you're Mort Saul, on November 21st, you had soured on JFK. Uh, no, I was just doing my regular stuff. You know, I had a television show at Channel 11 for Metro Media. And I was doing my usual stuff, making fun of the movies and making fun of the Democrats for being mild and the Republicans for being unconscious. <laughs> and I saw him from time to time. Uh but they didn't even invite me to the inauguration, you know. And remember, Lawford and I had the same manager. Well, Peter, I don't like idolatry. Peter Lawford barely got <laughs> invited to the inauguration. Um, would you? Is it conceivable, had he lived, that you would have voted for Goldwater? Uh, no, but I was at that convention, and uh, I met Nelson Rockefeller there. <laughs> At that convention, I got to meet him. And uh, no, it, it, Goldwater was set up there to take the fall. Nobody thought. And you remember Johnson used those commercials against him. And if you vote for him, we'll go to war. And the joke was, I did vote for him, and we did go to war. <laughs> so, uh, you know, but the liberals at that time, uh, you know, they need a boogeyman. So they got, they configured Goldwater as the enemy. So you so you had not completely soured on JFK. No, 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 no. Okay, so November. I didn't like the idea of the show business liberals telling me what to talk about because mm -hmm. they're famous for their infidelity. In what way? You know, as you can see. What do you mean by that? I mean that if you don't. Uh, told the line they don't hire people the same way at Universal producers all had a list on the desk of anybody that voted for Goldwater and if they came in to read for a part they didn't get it and then it's not America anymore so there was a black that's too simplistic for me 
You're saying there's a blacklist on both sides. Uh, yeah. Oh, sure. Of course. If people, this is a money-hungry country. That's the orientation. And if you make money for them and you're not welcome, that means there's a higher allegiance. So, and I made a lot of money for a lot of people. Where were you politically on November 21st, 1963? Were you, you were against Vietnam and the escalation? Yeah, of course. And I, and I, and I like Castro. And you like Castro. <laughs> and Che Guevara, sure. Okay. That's the kind of parents I had. I'm sorry, the kind of parents you had. Yeah, I had those kind of parents. From Montreal. Empathy with the uh, empathy with the working people, and obviously the civil rights movement and your pro environment, and okay, so November twenty second, nineteen sixty three, when you first heard that he was shot, I believe you were at home in Los Angeles. That's did, right. Did you? What was the first suspicion that you had? Well, I. <laughs> I wanted to know the detail. I didn't like the communal crying, but no detail. And then... Uh, Go on with that, you please. Know, please explain. You remember, uh, Excuse me for one second. Pleasure Proudy, David? Yes, I do. But go on for one second. What do you mean you didn't like the communal crying? Well, there was, there was a lot of sobbing, and uh, this is a terrible thing. Like, they can't stop it. Mm -hmm. But th there were a lot of questions. In other words, where was the presidential security detail? They were at Fort Hood. They were told to stand down. He shot from the window. Why didn't they nail down the windows and the manhole covers? Where's the detail? Well, we'll know when we get Oswald. Well, they question him for 10 hours. There's no record of the interrogation. Then Ruby comes in there and they say, this patriot shot him. But the patriot turns out to be a bag man. For the mob in Chicago, it started to fall apart right away. Right. I just want to get back to one thing that you said. You could not stand. You couldn't stand the communal sobbing. Yeah. That that's a distraction. The tears and the patriotism, and the it's an indulgence. The we hungry eye closed when that happened. The second mm -hmm. time when Bobby got it, Enrico said, "We're going to close." I said, "No, we're not." We're not going to be led in communal mourning by Walter Cronkite. We're going to ask who did it. Right. So yeah, by, sure. So by making something sacred, it in, it enables the cover-up, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. It, it, sure. Uh, that's that whole thing. You, then you can't say the the movie was lousy. What are you talking about? Oh, for Winfrey made this movie. <laughs> are you a bigot? It's that thing again. You know, the liberals, they all, they're all on the side of the angels. So how come I ain't happy? <laughs> well, but Why can't you take a girl to a drive-in movie anymore? <laughs> Conservatives do it with the American flag and patriotism. They hide behind our soldiers. They hide behind... 9-11. I mean, both sides. With it, it, both sides do it. That's one of the reasons the liberals should have unmasked 9-11. If they were real liberals. They should unmask 9-11. Yes. What do you mean? In that? other words, why didn't um, Dick Clark warn them that the Arabs were coming? Why is the 9-11 report, you can't comprehend it. It's incomprehensible. And I saw the hearings, too, and the tapes. You're, you're and I still don't know if they use thermite in that building, and there are no answers there. Incidentally, the only book that really took it on was a book by a Republican professor in Claremont. By the way, uh, the phones have stopped lighting up ever since you said there might be some truth to uh, the conspiracy behind 9-11. All of a sudden, the KPFK listeners love you. You so you. <laughs> well, they'll never love me because uh, <laughs> I'm not going to talk about Native Americans and how poorly we treat women <laughs> and uh, none of that. They've been... Uh, 
they've been talked out of their destiny. Their destiny is to save America. And they've been sidetracked by all this stuff. Let me get back to 9-11 and the loose change people. A clear majority of Americans right now still believe there was a conspiracy to kill President Kennedy. In fact, the percentage yeah, that's of true. The, the people who believe Lee, the idea that Lee Harvey Oswald was part of a conspiracy has a higher approval rating than Congress and the president combined. And yet we're told that we no longer believe there was a conspiracy. We're being told that Americans no longer buy into the idea that there was a conspiracy. It is declining. The number of Americans who believe, 60% of Americans believe there was a conspiracy, but it's at an all-time low. Do you think we will get to a point where a majority of Americans think Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone? No. It's going the other way. It's going the they other way. I don't believe that. They More. got a broker's mentality. It's Silicon Valley. This will be bad for my career if I'm weird. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean they believe it. Why aren't the archives open? Where's the president's brain? Why was Alan Dulles on the Warren Commission? This president's brain or JFK's brain? JFK's brain is missing. <laughs> right. They can't find it in the archives. Didn't Bobby Kennedy take it? No, that's that's a story. That's a contrived story, and that, that we had that whole thing for several years too. That the that the uh, family believes these investigations are gruesome and uh, so forth until they killed Bobby. Nobody believes Sir Han killed Bobby. The fatal wound is behind his right mastoid. There were 22 bullets in that uh, that board behind him, and he had a six-shooter. And the L.A. police took it down. And then you've got the coroner, Noguchi. I don't believe them. And the guy, the guy that wrote the book that this is all hokum is Bugliosi, who, of course, with the LAPD and Noguchi, solved the Manson case. Notice how they solve it. They scare you more. Mm -hmm. But that's the last time the DA's office won a case in L.A., by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Garrison never lost a capital case. You know that? In really? eight years. When, okay, so when did you go to work for Jim Garrison in New Orleans? Well, I was at Channel 11, and I was reading a war report. And we had a huge audience, and we showed this as a Bruder film, even though Tom Magazine forbade it. And so uh, the station called me in and said, you're grinding an axe. You have to have new evidence. And then Mark Lane had met Garrison. So I went to New Orleans and met him. What year was that? That's uh, about 65. 1965. You were at the height of your popularity as a comedian, and you kind of gave it all up to pursue the prosecution of Clay Shaw. Well, I didn't think there was going to be any American. I thought it was going to be a fascist country. If they can do that and not give an explanation, you got to oppose them. You can't go along with that madness. Look who they got to go along. Earl Warren. They targeted everybody. They're still lying. Last night, Jim Lehrer was on PBS saying, why didn't they use the bubble top on the car? He knows better than that. And so does Robin McNeil. PBS, by the way, contributed Wednesday night. They said Oswald turned out to be a lonely loser Marxist, a degenerate Marxist. That's an awful lot for one guy mm -hmm. <laughs> to accomplish at that age. Uh, there's no evidence of any of that. What happened was that Garrison followed everybody in the case, and he found out they all worked for the federal government. That's how he got started. And he had been an FBI agent for three years, and he had a pretty good life down there at that time. Then we began to get a lot of resistance. In fact, uh, you know, the Brokaw show that's on tonight is a book. You know that, David, yes. right? Yes, yes. In the book, 
uh, scoffing at everything I'm saying is Tom Hanks, who decided that it's amusing that uh, people think there's a conspiracy. Now, what's the name of this book? The Most Mediocre Generation? Where Were You? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it should have been. It, where Were You? And all these people chime in, you know, because we have to know where Robert De Niro was that day. And right. Vincent Bugliosi, uh has a, a piece in there. He says, I'm a patriot who was misled. <laughs> he says Mort Saul was a patriot who was misled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. was, I, I really reached your heights. So uh, after Clay Shaw was, I believe, acquitted, right? That's right. What did you then believe? What year was Clay Shaw acquitted, and what did you believe? What was after... that, about 69? I, I'm not sure. I, I think so. But what, what did you believe by then? Jack Ruby was I believe dead. that a conspiracy uh, shot the president. And by that time, I had reached uh, propagandistic proportions within the media from all the ridicule we were getting. And uh, Jim would be defeated for re-election, and Shaw perjured himself on the stand. You were dead. Because guess who his friend was? Uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. You do get something if you follow him. You don't get the men who kill the president, but you get something. Mm -hmm. And you were deputized by Jim Garrison. You were. That's right. I was an investigator in the office, which Bugliosi was shocked at. And uh, if you did, you ever see that show that Bob Whitey did on me, the loyal opposition? Yeah, of course. Well, you know, in that show, the deputy DA uh, Moose Chambra says. He was not more soul a comedian here. He was more soul the investigator. <laughs> so I was very proud of that. I deposed witnesses. Oh, yeah. And uh, we only became more convinced of our position. Do you believe that it was the CIA working with, or did you believe it was the CIA working with the Cosa Nostra? Did you think it was the CIA working alone? What was No, what? as Jim used to say, the guys at the CIA make the Cosa Nostra look like Shirley Temple. They'll do anything, as you can see from Snowden's revelation. And they did. And uh, it was out of the Western Hemisphere of the CIA with David Atlee Phillips. And, uh, and of course, our witnesses kept getting killed. You remember George DeMore and Shield? Uh, a terrible uh, casualty list of potential witnesses. People were being beaten and threatened, but the fact wouldn't go away. The president was gone, and this country went into perpetual war. Perpetual. Why? I mean, Obama says yesterday we're staying in Afghanistan. Did it, Diane Feinstein say anything, or, or uh, Nancy Pelosi, or Barbara Boxer? Nobody said anything. And it's further confused with the thing that he's from a minority. So the forces, you believe that the forces behind the assassination of JFK were the people who feared that he wouldn't have escalated Vietnam? That's correct. In order to be, re he was going to run for re-election, and he was going to pull out of Vietnam. And then it's all escalated by Johnson, but that's not emphasized by the press, because the press is controlled by the government. What did you think of the House Select Committee on Assassinations from Oh, we were very we were very impressed. I know a lot of guys on there. You know, Gary Hart was still working over there and um, Bob Tannenbaum, uh, Craig, the lawyer, uh, Craig, I forgot his first name, was the chief lawyer replaced by Blakey to be a government mouthpiece. And uh, of course the all the detectives told me that we're coming to the same place you and Jim were already. They told me that to my face. Right. The the nineteen so, the nineteen seventy nine House Select Committee on Assassinations officially said in their final report that they believe there was a conspiracy to kill President yeah. Kennedy, but they weren't quite sure who was behind it. Well, of course, they never investigated. So. Uh, they couldn't be sure, and Johnson had all that stuff in the archives. And the only guy that was elected and had police powers was Garrison. So they decided to turn him off because they couldn't buy him. 
They right. bought everybody else. Johnson pulled all that stuff away for 75 years and escalated in Vietnam, and it's the first war we ever lost, as I recall. The committee said that there's absolutely no basis that the Soviet government or Cuba was involved in the conspiracy to kill Kennedy. The first, no. And the first thing that President Johnson said was, do not link Lee Harvey Oswald to the Soviet Union because we'll have World War One. World War uh, we'll have World War One all over again because World War One started after an assassination. Do you think that there was? A, I know you believe it was the CIA, but what if? How much did you explore the possibility that Fidel Castro was behind the assassination because Bobby Kennedy, Operation Mongoose, they were trying to kill. Castro. Oh, as a matter of fact, uh, the CIA made 636 attempts on Castro with their customary efficiency. Uh, the, Cuba had nothing to gain. Johnson was anti-Cuban, and so was every other president, all the way through Obama. What did he have to gain? And he had to send that guy? I mean, Oswald never shot at anybody. They just chased him into that theater. Okay. And by the way, when they arrested him, David, in his wallet, he has the unlisted phone number of the special agent in charge of the FBI office in Dallas, which nobody talks about on the uh, major networks or CNN. God, is that un unbelievable. When Lee Harvey Oswald was apprehended, he had the phone number of the FBI Bureau Chief of Dallas. Yeah, Jim Hosty had in his back pocket in his wallet. And uh, and he worked, you know, he had a queue clearance. He worked at the Atsugi Air Force Base where they refueled U-2s and SR-71s. Now, I heard all this baloney on the network about what a great shot he was. He was good enough to work for the government at times. And also, when he's in Russia... And he's fed up with it. He wants to come back here. The American embassy advanced him $500 for the plane, which is very forgiving of him, I would think, for a traitor. Mm -hmm. It's a very thin story. And, of course, the president wasn't shot from the back. The evidence here, as harsh as this is going to sound, uh, but if not now, when, uh, as the rabbi said, they altered the president's body at Parkland Hospital, and then they flew away to Washington to finish the lie at Bethesda. In fact, uh, Garrison has a wonderful line in his book. He said, uh, Lyndon Johnson didn't, it wasn't a departure from Dallas as much as a getaway. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> and it kills me. That's hysterical. Anytime somebody can state the case, yeah, it has to be humor, even if it's black humor. Well, the the House Select Committee on Assassi the House Select Committee on Assassinations concluded that four shots, not three, were fired. How many shots do you think were fired? Well, there are. Uh, there's the shot to his throat. There's the one to his skull, and uh, there was a shot that may have come from the Dell Tex building. And then there's that pristine bullet they found at the hospital. Remember that one? Mm -hmm. That's on a stretcher. Uh, this was a professional group of mechanics. And the CIA gets them from all over the world. They might have been from Palestine or Croatia. And they were out of town in an hour. And you remember the picture of the three tramps, right? Yes. Being led with not carrying Dallas police equipment. And being led by somebody who looks suspicious, like, like Edwin Lonsdale. And Prouty, by the way, uh, Prouty says, you know, everybody in the cabinet was gone when Kennedy was killed. They were all sent out of the country. They leave one cabinet member to be the president, in effect. And Prouty was sent to Christchurch, New Zealand. And when the president was killed, the papers were out in Christchurch with a picture of Oswald and a bio. So they were ready. This lonely loser who went to the Minsk, you know, et cetera, et cetera. 
but it didn't hold. Nobody believes it. Right. The guys that are peddling it don't believe it. Bob Schieffer and Jim Lehrer and uh, Wolf Blitzer, they don't believe it. They have no credibility. Right. And then and then you've got a Walter Cronkite, you know, who led the crime. You know, he wanted Garrison arrested at one point. You know, and he said he's up to no good. Wanted him arrested, and but then he was in favor of Vietnam too. It's not Edward R. Murrow. Let me close by saying that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the House Select Committee says that four shots were fired. They concluded that the fourth shot came from a second assassin who was standing on the grassy knoll, but missed. Uh, Our photographic expert, Robert Groden from Philly, uh, shows rifle barrels over the fence on the grassy knoll. And when you rerun that film, everybody runs up the grassy knoll. Nobody runs to the school with the buzz, right? Mm-hmm. Then a lot of it revealed itself later to Garrison by the suppression, where the suppression came from. It came mostly from the federal government, a kind of discreditation. The government may have paid for Clay Shaw's lawyers. The defense of him was by the diehard liberals, you know. Well, as a fine man who worked for the CIA, and uh, we had a lot of witnesses. You know, we had a Fred Lehman's who ran this um, uh, steam room down at Canal Street. And he said, Clay Shaw comes in there all the time with Oswald. And then he said, if you call me to testify, I'm going to have trouble because I've been threatened by the Internal Revenue Service. Then I got into New York, and I went up to my agent's, who were then uh, uh, ICM, and there were two guys there from the Treasury. They said, if one of our agents threatens somebody, we have to know, because that's really malfeasance. And I said, I work for the DA who says the government killed the president, and you work for the government, so why should I answer this? Wow. And he said, we work for the government, we work for the Treasury. We, we don't work for the CIA. He volunteered the CIA. This is all, again, you'll notice, under the veil of secrecy and security. Mm -hmm. All of that, all of the misleading of people on the air, it all starts when Johnson runs uh, the news film for Paley and lets the CIA have the first cut. Kennedy never did that. Well, he wasn't there that long. And he didn't have that great a crowd around him. I would question the credentials of Arthur Schlesinger or uh, McGeorge Bundy or uh, any of the crew that stayed on with Johnson. They, uh, you know, Gal- Galbraith held me up to great ridicule, John Kenneth Galbraith. So they weren't true to him. He was true to them. So the liberals, you're saying kind of turned their back on Kennedy after he was shot. They ran with they ran with the power. I mean, uh, look at all the presidents since then. When I was on Channel 13, Jimmy Carter swore to me he'd open the case again when he was running. And I think he's the most uh, honorable of the bunch. But uh, Clinton didn't open the case again. And Reagan didn't open the case again. I knew him very well. Uh, what about the George- only thing about Republicans is they're a little better about letting you be yourself. The liberals have mastered crying. You know, the statue of Martin Luther King, who shot him. Well, Mark Lane says that the FBI shot him. What do you think? It's obvious that the government can kill people without being accountable. The bodies from Jonestown come back with the Kool-Aid, and they unload them at Dover Air Force Base. Who else is ready for 900 bodies? And uh, nobody makes any connection because they don't think it's good for them. Hoover was after uh, King for years. 
But the farthest we can get with the King case is for Spike Lee and Denzel Washington to make a movie about it. And then there's the whole crowd that uses guilt for career advancement. You know, Bill Cosby. <laughs> what about what about Bobby Kennedy? He was the head of the Justice Department. He was the Attorney General when his brother was killed. Uh, I can tell you about Bobby Kennedy. Uh, I knew him. I had dinner with him at David Brinkley's house. And he said to me, it's political suicide to run now and, and uh, criticize Vietnam. And I said, Gene McCarthy's committing suicide then. Going to be nominated. No, I'm going to be nominated, but I have to make my move. Then we had a, a guy that worked for him who came to Garrison's office and said, he'll make his move when it's a proper time. He's got to win the California primary. And Garrison said, if he wins the primary there, he's a dead man. He'll never get to the convention. Wow. And the guy said, well, who are we going to believe? A, a cracker cop and a night talk comedian? We've got experts. Who are the experts? Walter Sheridan at the Justice Department, who's advising Bobby and attacking Garrison. You remember Garrison got equal time from NBC because they attacked him there. Frank McGee wrote the attack. Then I got him on the Carson show largely because they all criticized them and they wanted to clean the slate. Then he came on there that I never worked on it. I'm not sure again, but it doesn't matter. The truth won't go away. Bobby was walking a very thin line there. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Johnson didn't even want him in the cabinet and he was against Johnson. You know, I remember when they picked Johnson out. As the running mate, Bobby was against it, and Johnson knew it. And then he took second position. But he didn't do a hell of a lot of crying when the president died. And now the liberals are so desperate, they say to me, up here, they say, well, you know, he passed the Civil Rights Bill. You know, I don't know when George Clooney and Jeffrey Katzenberg are going to get over the Civil Rights Bill, <laughs> but it's high time. <laughs> <laughs> These guys are unbelievable. The world is not enough. What are we going to lose? We've got to save America and get the girl. Did Bobby Kennedy pursue the conspiracy the way he should have yes. while he was well, attorney no, general? No, 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 no. He just kept track of us because he thought we were going to ruin his chances. If we, you know, he said, he said to me, I'll get the guys who did this to Jack. The guys. Plural. He didn't say they got Lee Harvey Oswald. And that corny speech he made when uh, when King was killed, he said, you know, I know how you feel because a white man killed my brother. Well, and that was really throwing peanuts to the crowd. I mean, in November... They're talking all... Huh? On November 22nd, when... Uh, Bobby Kennedy got the gleeful call from J. Edgar Hoover that his brother... Yeah, you bet. Uh, was, did Bobby know who did it? Uh, he knew Oswald didn't do it. He knew that the government had been overthrown. Uh, but, you know, we were close. We had... Sheila and I, that was my wife then, I was working at the cellar door in uh, Georgetown, and when I went to do the second show, uh, Bobby said, uh, uh, did Mort write for my brother, and is he working, and et cetera, et cetera. And she said he was here for an hour, why don't you ask him yourself? You had to answer him in those terms. Although I'm, I'm uh, encouraged by... Uh, Bob Kennedy Jr. in the Rolling Stone thing today. Uh, I said a long time ago, in an effort to bring him out of the shadows, I, you know, he has, you know, how his voice is always like his throat is closed, like his mother. I said if he said the right thing about his father, he'd find his voice again. <laughs> the family didn't help us at all, David. 
the family was no help at all. You know, I ran into Jackie at an art gallery at 73rd Madison. And I walked in there, and she said to me, I know, I know. <laughs> and she did know, too. They all knew. What did George Herbert Walker Bush know? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I never, I never questioned him. But uh, with, his, uh, with his background with the CIA, I'm sure he was in touch with him. You know, these guys are all around us. Carry a skull and bones and Yale. And when he was looking through the gate with Jane Fonda at Kissinger's office, dressed as a, a, a young GI, he was a CIA guy then. Notice how well he fills the role now of yelling at the Arabs and everything. He was CIA? He set up. Oh, sure. And he was in special operations in Vietnam. Swift boats, I think they were. Yeah. As I recall. Right. Mark Candidate, nothing to say. Uh, Bob Kerry, he has nothing to say. I met with him about teaching at the new school, you know. And I said, I want to teach the Garrison case. And he said to me, I don't know why you want to work that hard. <laughs> even after flying me into New York. And, you know, I taught that course at Claremont. At Claremont McKenna. I taught the Kennedy, uh, the whole Garrison case, and I also taught a course on the CIA. And some of the kids were very encouraging. The administration was not too encouraging. Claremont College is like a a stud farm for retired Republican racehorses. <laughs> That's all it is anyway. Uh, I've been in some very painful places, you know, <laughs> trying to make a living and trying to keep my credibility with people and trying to stay married and all that. Didn't succeed at all of it. But that doesn't mean they were right. You enlisted for the Air Force in 1945. Yeah. <laughs> I want to be a hero. Well, you were willing to lose it all for our country. and Yeah, I wanted to hear Glenn Miller's band and have a girl write me letters. I believed all that. And I wish you could go to a movie and see that. And, and you were willing to sacrifice, make the ultimate sacrifice for our country. If we brought well, back... If we brought back the draft, wouldn't the powers that be end up in a lot of trouble? Because we lack... Yes, would be great. Great idea, yeah. We lack people like you. In other words, at the height of the Clay Shaw investigation, you were driven off the road by some dark forces. I suspect you were willing to make the ultimate sacrifice because you're from that generation. I think by not having a draft, not enough Americans are taught to make the ultimate sacrifice for their country. That's very good. And, you know, you can make the ultimate sacrifice for your country in ways other than serving overseas. I mean, what you did was very dangerous and continues to be incredibly dangerous. The kids I know in Berkeley, David, when I was first up there in the early 50s, uh, you know, when they were conscious objectors, they went and worked in mental hospitals. They didn't duck the country. They cared about their fellow man. That was a very good generation. You know, I married a girl from that generation in 55. I don't know how much they care now, but they sure did then. They don't. The, do you think the, the richest 1% or the, the 500 families that control the money, they don't want us to sacrifice or care about the country. They would rather have us just look away because people like you are trouble for them. Yeah, probably. Uh, I didn't know how much of that was in me. You know, it's my father. I was listening to my dad. And I really wanted to be a hero. I wanted to get my wings. And uh, and I believed in Roosevelt. And... Uh, 
I'm, I believe in a lot of people that don't believe in I believe in Freud. <laughs> yeah. And uh, now they uh, they don't. They believe in uh, uh, Silicon Valley. And getting theirs. Yes, first. Getting theirs And first. foremost. And the women want to take a step up, which turns out to be a step down. Mm-hmm. Women are a great part of this equation, you know. When I was doing all this, I had a girl cheering from the wings. Uh, not lately. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've been talking with my hero, Mort Saul, and uh, wanted to ask you one final question, and that is, what sure. is what is the biggest lie that Americans believe? about November 22nd, 1963. Uh, that, uh, what, that this lonely guy did it. The government murdered the president. And until we clean that up, we can't get on with the business of this being America, where the dreams come true. We have to lead by example, not with a gun in our hand. And we used to be able to do that. Great. And those of us who believe that, you know, it's going to be. I want to thank you for being so well organized. I wish your guest was that well organized. <laughs> <laughs> You're fantastic. Am I going to see you up here when you come up there? I'm I'm coming up just to see you. Are you? I, this has been. I I I want to talk to you about so many other things besides the the Kennedy assassination. But, oh yeah, that's but, only the latest manifestation, right? And you—they're ready to put to put us all in gas tank. <laughs> Anything it takes to keep what they have, and ironically, they have no credibility. Look at him with this health plan; <laughs> it's unbelievable. Did and they... the movie stars, you know. Did they need to assassinate JFK? When you look at the way Congress is able to just paralyze the government, have they found a more efficient way to get things done, a less violent way to get things done in this country? And by they, I mean the richest... No, that's the question. The severity of the punishment makes it we have to recreate an index of what he meant. It's not hero worship. Why would they? Why would they go so far? And they're in the saddle. There's no reason for them to get out. I mean, look at look at this thing with uh, uh, Snowden and uh, Glenn Greenwald. And of course, to really prove that, you have to read the Guardian. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, well, that's let me, easy enough. Let me ask you that, and then we'll wrap it up. I promise. They there were sure. ways. I agree, obviously, I agree with you that JFK was a threat to the people who were making the most money from the escalation in Vietnam. But there were other ways to paralyze his presidency. Yeah, there certainly are. But they decided that uh, uh, he couldn't withdraw from Southeast Asia. And it's obvious he didn't want to go ahead with the missile crisis. Because I heard on the inside track that McCain was on the Essex, ready to invade Havana, and that uh, and that during the last meeting about bombing Havana, that General LeMay raised his fist at Kennedy. Hmm. And I heard that in the inner circles. When you say McCain, McCain's father or the McCain? No, him. If it's any comfort, he's got marriage trouble, too, just like the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> it's universal. The women are on strike. They don't want anybody to love them. They corrupt them. Uh, it's funny, isn't it? Yeah, well. All those girls in Berkeley, you could go to the meeting and meet them. I Can't ma- do it anymore. I married a Berkeley girl. Yeah, well, that happened once. It doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> Uh, Berkeley is the same, by the way. I was over there the other day. But you're right. If the draft were instituted, it would marshal all the young people. Great point you made. 
God bless you. I can't wait to see you again. And thank you so much for taking time to do this on this. Make your first stop to Throckmorton Theater. I will. And thank you, <laughs> thank you, Lucy Mercer and Mark Pitta for arranging this you interview. Bet. Thank you. I'll call talk... any time, David. Th- that means a lot to me. Thank you. The 